The talk of this session is by Nina Balkan uh, from the Georgia uh, Institute of Technology about learning uh, graduation functions. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll be talking about learning valuation functions, which is a topic at the intersection between machine learning, optimization, and algorithmic and current economics. All right. So a first step uh, in economic modeling is to uh, model uh, individuals have having, as having valuation functions that describe how much value they place on different uh, outcomes or events. So for example, I think I'm going to stop over here. For example, this can be their value on a vacation package in uh, Switzerland or their value on a set of items uh, in a shopping list for a supermarket. And in this talk, uh, I will be focusing on in particular on combinatorial settings where we assume that we have a set of n items, this for example can be the set of items for sale uh, in a supermarket, and the valuation uh, function here is of a various bundle or subset of the items that the customer might, might be considering. And uh, the question, the specific question that I'm going to look at in this talk is, uh, if we don't know the valuation function of a customer, uh, can we learn it from past or obs observed data? And this is uh, an important problem motivated by uh, various applications. So for example, uh, it is very common for supermarket chains today to keep track of the purchases of our customers, for instance, by using a loyalty card. Now clearly, given access to this data, it would be very useful for them to learn the valuation function uh, of a customer or the valuation function of a typical customer in order to target advertisement or coupons better and ultimately to do better pricing. And uh, Similarly, uh, companies like Orbit or Expedia could, could hope to learn the valuation function uh, of a typical customer in order to suggest, uh, to make better recommendations and ultimately to obtain better profit. So motivated by such scenario, uh, in our work we study the problem of learning interesting, rich classes of valuation functions uh, based on uh, past data. And uh, I will now uh, briefly describe the types of valuation functions uh, I'm going to study. And then uh, in a few slides, I'm also going to make the learning model that we consider more precise, precisely. All right, so recall, we are in a, in a combinatorial setting. So we have a ground set V of n uh, items. And uh, given a set S, I'm going to denote by F of S the valuation that the user has uh, for the set S. All right, and uh, throughout this talk, I'm uh, going to consider uh, well-studied classes, well-studied subclasses of subadditive valuations, which, as we know, express uh, substitutes but no complementarities. So formally, uh, uh, valuation function f is subadditive. If for all subsets st of the ground set, we have the uh, value uh, on the set s in on t is upper bounded by the value on the set s plus the value on the set t. And uh, for Bobby talk, we'll only be considering valuation functions that are non-negative and also monotone. So uh, the buyer never minds having more items. And more specifically, we'll be looking at two uh, well-studied subclasses of, sub of uh, subadditive valuations. In particular, we'll be looking at submodular valuations and XOS valuations. And it's well known that submodular valuations is a subclass of XOS valuations, which in turn is a subclass of subadditive uh, valuations. And I'm going to spend uh, most of my talk talking about learning submodular valuations. And this is based on joint work with Nick Harvey uh, to appear in the upcoming talk. And then in the last few minutes, I'm going to mention some interesting new results on learning XOS valuations. And this is joint work with Florin Constantin, Sato Rivata, and Lei Wang. All right, so I'll start by talking about learning uh, submodular valuations. And just to briefly remind you the definition, uh, a real value set function defined over all subsets of the ground set is submodular. If for, a, if for all subsets S, T, uh, S and T of the ground set, we have at the value of, uh, the, uh, we have at F of S intersect T plus F of S union T is upper bounded by F of S plus F of T. And clearly, if the function is non-negative, then any submodular function is a subarity function. And now it's well known that uh, a submodular function is 
uh, it's all known that the function is a modular if and only if it satisfies an intuitive notion of diminishing marginal returns, which says that for any two subsets, uh, uh, T and S, which are subset to the ground set, for any item X not in S, we have uh, the marginal value of X given T uh, is uh, at least the marginal value of X given S. So for instance, uh, uh, for the supermarket uh, example, the value to you of a new box of cereal is smaller if you already have cereal in your cart. And let me also mention a couple more mathematical examples of some modular functions. Uh, first, it's well known that the rank function of a matroid uh, is some modular. So in particular, the rank function of a linear matroid is some modular. So here you are given, uh, say, n vectors, say in Rn, and then the function f defined as f of s is the dimension of the space spent by vector in s, so we can show that this function is some modular. And the different example is if h is a concave function, then uh, the function f defined as f of s is h of size of s, that can also be shown to be some modular. All right, and as I mentioned a few times already, so in this work we study uh, the learnability of such valuation functions uh, from data. And in particular, we consider a distributional learning model and we develop something like a pack style analysis for this scenario. So informally, the learning model that we consider in this work is as follows. So we assume that we have some, this, some source of data, some distribution um, of our unlabeled examples. These examples then uh, get labeled according to some fixed but unknown uh, target function which for now we think about it as being some modular. So this can be, for example, the valuation function uh, of a customer. And these labeled examples are then input to a learning algorithm, which then outputs a hypothesis function. And the goal is to design a learning algorithm that outputs a hypothesis function that is close to the target function on most of the examples that come from the same source. Okay, so formally, uh, in the training phase, the learning algorithm can use uh, a set S of polynomially, polynomially many uh, labeled examples. These examples are assumed to be drawn IID from some fixed but unknown distribution uh, over subsets of the ground set. And we also assume that these examples are labeled according to some fixed but unknown target function, which for now we assume that is uh, uh, non-negative monotone and some modular. And uh, the goal is to output a hypothesis function G that with high probability, with probability at least one minus delta over a draw of the examples in the training set produces, is a good approximation to the target function on most of the examples that come from the same distribution. As down from D, right, right, exactly, yes, yes. doesn't have to be some modular, or, but it, it happens in our case. So, yeah, if you insist on being from the same family, that would be called proper learning. Right, so again, what we want, that with high probability over the draw of the training set, we want um, uh, to be uh, close to the target function, to be within a factor of alpha of the target function on most of the examples that come from the same distribution D. So we want to be probably mostly approximately correct, and actually that's why we call this model the PMAC learning model. <coughs> and notice that actually when alpha is one, we recover the classic PAC model for learning uh, Boolean functions. But since here we're trying to learn more complicated real valued functions, uh, really both alpha and epsilon measure how well we are doing. Right? And actually it's also important to note that even if the target function and the underlying distribution are defined over an exponentially sized instance space, we want to use uh, only polynomial number of examples and polynomial time no, uh, in order to output a function that is close to the target function. Why would we have a strong representation? Right, so the question is what approximation factors can you get by using only, so that's the main question exactly. And uh, this is, uh, in this slide will answer these questions. All right, so within this model now, our, uh, our main results for learning some modular functions are as follows. First, we show a general upper bound. We can show that there exists a polynomial time 
uh, algorithm for PMAC learning the class of non-negative monotone sum modular functions with an approximation factor of uh, square root of n. Now this is our upper bound. Now we also show uh, actually a really surprising lower bound. We show that any algorithm that uses only a polynomial number of examples cannot PMAC learn the class of some modular functions with an approximation factor better than n to the one third. Uh, a small representation. Sure, we can think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can. So there is a, a modular function that can be approximated with some function. Of a small representation. Small yes, exactly. And actually, this uh, this lower bound will show up. You'll see in a second. So, it's How a so, so, so if that's the case, so then this is a strong result. Then what the reason is. So I'm trying to understand the result. Yeah, so the lower bound is really interesting. Yeah, so the, I'll, come, I'll come to it. I'll go to, I'll go, yeah, I'll talk about it. All right, so let's, we'll discuss more once we get to the lower bound. All right, and uh, uh, actually in special cases, we also show better approximation factors. So for example, if the function that we are trying to learn is a mitral rank function and the underlying distribution is a product distribution over the elements of the ground set, then we can get a constant factor approximation. All right, and I now I would like to spend a few minutes, uh, like uh, about 10 minutes, talking about some of the key ideas improving these results. Uh, and I'll start by talking about uh, the upper bound. So, and actually, since it's sim simpler to, to, to think about it, I'll first present a weaker upper bound for the uh, more general class of subarity functions, and then I'll describe how to modify the argument to get the square root of an upper bound for learning submodular functions. All right, and here is a simple fact about subarity functions. One can easily show that any non-negative monotone subarity function can be approximated to even a factor of n by a linear function. So this is very simple. All we have to verify is that this function over here, g of s, uh, defined as sum over x in s of f of x. So this function satisfies this inequality. g of s is lower bounded by f of s and upper bounded by n times f of s. So here, the first inequality follows from subadditivity, and the second one follows from monotonicity. All right, so visually we get this picture. Right, and so, uh, right, and this fact, so the fact that any uh, non-negative monotone uh, subadditive function can be approximated to even a factor of n by a linear function. So this fact over here, if you think about it, implies that examples uh, of this form, chi of s, f of s plus, and chi of s n times f of s minus, are linearly separable in Rn plus one. So here, chi of s is a feature, uh, is the indicator vector for the set S. And so this part over here, chi of s, f of s, is a feature part of our example. And this is uh, the labor pl part. Plus is the label part of our example. And again, here, chi of s n times f of s is a feature part, and here, minus is a label part. And the fact, this fact that this function, any uh, Subarity function can be approximate to even a factor of n by a linear function implies that examples of this form are linearly separable in Rn plus one. And so this then suggests trying to reduce the problem of learning uh, a subarity function to the problem of learning a linear separator. So what we could hope to do is to, um, to map our original training set in Rn plus one then learn a linear separator in Rn plus one and then induce a linear function uh, and output a linear function induced by that linear separator. Now the problem is however that the data induced in Rn plus one, so in particular examples of this form, are not IID, right, clearly. And so what we do, uh, what we need to do is to use a slight trick. And so in particular, uh, starting from the original distribution of a subset of the ground set, we get a new distribution in Rn plus one as follows. Uh, to draw a sample from this uh, distribution, we first draw a sample from the original distribution. We then flip a coin. If it comes up head, we add this positive example. Otherwise, we add this negative example. And then what we can show is that uh, a linear separator with low error on the induced distribution in Rn plus one induces a linear function with an approximation factor of n uh, on the original data. Okay, so now given uh, this claim, our algorithm is as follows. Uh, so the input to the algorithm is a set of training examples, S1, F of S1, uh, S2, F of S2, and so on, SM, F of SM. Now for each example SI, what we do, we flip, a we flip a coin. If it comes up heads, we add this 
positive example to the training set. Otherwise, we add this negative example to the training set. And then we learn uh, a linear separator uh, in Rn plus one, and we simply output a linear function induced by uh, that linear separator. All right? And now we can actually use uh, standard uh, uh, sample complexity results for learning Boolean function uh, to show that if the number of examples that we see is roughly uh, n over epsilon, then with high probability, the function g that we output approximates the target function within a factor of n on most of the examples coming from uh, the same distribution. And in the case where the target function is a submodular function, we can use a stronger structural result uh, due to Gomans et al. that says that any non-negative monotone submodular function can be approximated to even a square root of n by square root of a linear function. Okay, and uh, by using the stronger structure result, we slightly have to modify the algorithm. We have to replace f with f squared, uh, output a slightly different function over here, but overall using the similar ideas, we can show that if the number of examples we see in the training set is roughly n over epsilon, then again, we have probability output uh, uh, hypothesis function G that approximates the target function within a factor of square root of n on a one minus epsilon fraction of the examples coming from the same distribution. All right, this is our most uh, general upper bound. Uh, as I already mentioned, we also show really surprising lower bound. And in particular, we show that uh, uh, no algorithm can PMAC learn the class of non negative monotone submodular functions with an approximation factor better than uh, n to the one third. And uh, the details of the construction are somewhat complicated, so I'm gonna present some of the only the main ideas. And so here is uh, the high level plan uh, of the proof. So first we're gonna use the fact that um, uh, any metro even function is submodular. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna construct a new hard family of metroids that has the following properties. So there exist subsets A1, A2, AL. These are subsets of the ground set and there are super polynomial in many of them. So there exist super polynomial many subsets, A1, A2, AL of the ground set, and there exist two values, high and low, separated by roughly uh, uh, an, an n to the one third multiplicative factor, such that for any assignment of high and low on these subsets, there exists a matroid in our family whose rank function achieves that assignment. All right, and so once we are able to show this, then this gives us, what we, uh, gives, gives us what we want because for instance, if we pick the target function at random by flipping a fair coin to, des to decide between high and low on these subsets, then really no learning algorithm can do better than just randomly guessing on any of the subset it had not seen the training set. And since uh, L is so large, it's super polynomial, if the distribution, if the underlying distribution is uniform over these subsets, then, uh, uh, and then if we only use a polynomial uh, training sample, right, then clearly we're only gonna see less than one over poly for any poly, uh, and so we're gonna do badly uh, on most of the sets. So can you make L bigger if you extend L to the flat? Uh, sure, but all we needed is to be super polynomial, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually we worked hard to get such a high gap here, uh, so. And actually, we had to, to come up with a new family of metroids. So none of the existing uh, families of metroids gave a gap. The only, uh, they only gave us a gap, of constant factor uh, gap. And for a while, actually, we were trying to prove a constant factor upper bound, but it turned out that there is this lower bound. So, right, and the details of the metroid constructions are somewhat complicated, but uh, I, uh, I would like to give you a feel of the type of metroid we're using this, uh, to prove this lower bound. Uh, first of all, uh, a well-known class of uh, metroids are partition metroids. So in this case, we have um, k disjoint subsets, a1, a2, a k. These are disjoint subsets of the ground set. And we also have k numbers, uh, uh, so numbers 1, 2, k. Um, each ui is smaller than size of a i minus 1. And then the independent sets here are those subsets of the ground set that have the property that the cardinality of the intersection between i and a j is upper bounded by uj for all j. And again, if these sets are all disjoint, sets A1, A2, AK are all disjoint, then uh, we, can, we get a metroid. Now, however, um, if the sets are not disjoint, then this might not be a metroid. And in particular, uh, I mean, as a simple example, let's assume that N is five, and A1 is one, two, three, A2 is three, four, five, and U1 and U2 are both two. 
But if you think about it, both uh, the set 1, 2, 4, 5, and 2, 3, 4, they are both maximal independent sets in this family. Uh, they are both maximal sets in this family, but they do not have the same cardinality. And so this contradicts one of the Maitre properties. Now, however, uh, for instance, for k equals 2, it turns out that if we add an additional constraint on the size of the intersection between i and the union of a1 and a2, then we get the matroid. So basically, if we had a constraint uh, on the size of the intersection between uh, uh, i and a1, and the constraint on the size of the intersection between i and a2, then we also need to add a constraint on the size of the intersection between i and the union of a1 and a2, and this uh, uh, constraint has to somehow depend on the cardinality of the intersection between a1 and a2. Okay, this is for k equals 2. Now, in our work, we generalize this uh, from two sets, from just two sets to many sets. And here, what we have to do, we have to impose uh, constraints on the uh, cardinality of the intersection between i and unions of many sets ai. So this is aj here is union over uh, all indices i and j of ai. Right? So we have to impose constraints on the cardinality of the intersection between i and aj for any subset j of 1, 2 through k. Now, what constraint do we impose? Well, Ideally, we'd like just this term, sum over j of uj. However, this doesn't work even for k equals 2. But it, what it turns out to, to work is to add this uh, correcting term over here, which is uh, always smaller or equal to 0. Uh, it's 0 when the sets are disjoint, and it's also very small in the set when the sets are nearly disjoint. OK, and then we can show that if we, uh, we get, a, uh, again, a, a matroid by doing so. Uh, and uh, uh, right. And uh, however, this construction still works only for k smaller or equal to n. When k is greater than n, this function f becomes negative, so the, 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 this family becomes empty. So we had to do further tricks in order to, in the end, get us uh, uh, to, to, in the end, be able to work with super polynomial many subsets a1, a2, a k. All right, and so uh, right, after further work, we again get to this picture that says that there exists a uh, super polynomial in many subsets a1, a2, uh, ak, these are subsets of the ground set, uh, actually a1, a2, l, I have on this slide, subsets of the ground set, uh, and there exist these two values, high and low, separated by a large multiplicative factor, such that for any assignment of high and low on these sets, there exists a matroid in our family whose rank function achieves that assignment. And as I discussed, this then uh, gives us a desired lower bound. And uh, right, and uh, um, as I already mentioned, we also uh, complement against this lower bound with a, a square root of an uh, upper bound. Right, and I think that in particular, this lower bound construction was, uh, is extremely surprising. All right, and for the last few minutes, I want to, to, to briefly mention some uh, uh, new results on learning uh, uh, other interesting uh, subclasses of stability function. In particular, I want to talk about learning XOS valuations. So XOS valuations lie, lie in between the class of some modular valuations and the class of uh, stability valuations. And one very ni ni nice thing, uh, one very nice thing about uh, XOS valuations is that they come up with a natural representation. So in particular, a function f is xos if it can be written as a uh, max of sums where the sums are allowed to overlap. So uh, for instance, assume that f is a value uh, of a customer uh, on a bundle of vacation activities. Then in this case, the items would be the types of vacation activities, and each or three would correspond to a vacation site. And then the value uh, of uh, the customer on a uh, bundle of activities will be the maximum uh, value uh, of that bundle over all possible locations. So for instance, in this example here, uh, the value uh, on the set 1 and 2 uh, will be 16 because of the Switzerland tree. And the value on the set 2 and 3, that means, uh, I guess, dining and secret will be 10 because of the uh, Romania tree. All right, and from uh, a learning perspective, so in, uh, in our work we show the following results for learning XOS valuations. First of all, we again show that there exists an algorithm for PMAC learning the class of XOS uh, functions with respect to an arbitrary input distribution of an approximation factor of, of square root of n. 
And in order to, to prove this, we had to prove a new structural result that says that any XOS valuation can be approximated within a square root of n by a square root of a linear function. And then once we had this structural result, then we can use a similar trick uh, as the one that I described for subadditive and submodular functions. Okay? Now we also show uh, uh, a general lower bound, in particular, again, show that no algorithm can PMAC learn the class of XOS valuations with an approximation factor of square root of n. And actually, this construction here was significantly simpler compared to the n to the one, to the one third construction for some model evaluations. So this was much cleaner, much simpler. But now, most interestingly, actually, uh, and actually I should mention in this construction here, the, the target function could have uh, potentially a super polynomial number of all trees. And now, the interesting fact is that if we are trying to learn uh, functions that uh, are, have a small representation, that, only, that have only, uh, say, a polynomial number of trees in their representation, then we can get a much better approximation factor. So we can circumvent this lower bound, we can get a much better approximation factor. So in particular, if the target function has only, uh, say, a polynomial number of all trees, then we can get an n to the 1 over epsilon, uh, n to the epsilon approximation in time n to the 1 over epsilon for any epsilon. And similarly, the target function is representable by R trees, and we can get an R to the epsilon approximation in time, I guess, n to the 1 over epsilon again. All right, and uh, uh, the main idea here, uh, so just at a very high level, the main idea here is to note the fact that the target function, which in this case is the maximum of, by definition, the maximum over R linear functions, where uh, R is the number of trees, R is the number of R trees, uh, R, R is the number of all trees in its representation. So this target function has the property that its elf power uh, is approximated within a factor of R by a linear function over somehow extended features, which are L tuples, where L, uh, L tuples, well, L is uh, one over epsilon. And so using this fact, uh, and then similar uh, technique as we had for learning, a similar trick as we had for learning some modular and some evaluations, then we get uh, the desired learnability result. So this is a high level idea. All right. So to summarize, so in this work we analyze uh, learnability of important uh, classes of uh, sub sub important subclasses of subadditive evaluations, in particular some modular evaluations and uh, XOS evaluations, and we provide uh, nearly tight upper and lower bounds on their intrinsic learnability. Now, uh, uh, at the technical level, our analysis for learning some modular evaluations reveal some unexpected structural and extremal properties of some modular uh, evaluations, some modular functions in general. And uh, our results for XOS valuations uh, highlight the importance of taking into account the, the, uh, the complexity of the target function. Right? And uh, I guess from an uh, algorithmic game theory perspective, uh, right, the results of this type could lead to algorithms for improved economic decision making. All right? Thank you. So we have a factor of n for uh, an upper bound of n. Uh, and I guess the result for XO evaluations also implies a lower bound of square root of n. Uh, we do not, I do not work hard on trying to see what is the right bound there. Okay. 